Hello, and welcome to episode three of season four of the Offstage Mic. I mentioned in episode one of this season, so two episodes back now, that we are working on some new things to bring you this season. And today, the day has come to tell you more about that. So you may remember, I also talked about the theme for this season in that first episode. I talked about the theme being you, your leadership, and your career in arts management. So today we are introducing a new series called the Success Series, which is all about arts administrators, meaning people with careers in arts management who have done just that, achieved success, and more so have overcome frustrations and challenges in navigating their careers. And they really broke through all that to achieve the success we're gonna share with you. In other words, all of that is to say, we are peeling back the curtain a little bit on what it looks like to navigate careers in the arts and specifically in arts administration. In this series, we are going to be talking to folks at really different points in their careers. That's everyone from students to entry level, early career, mid career, an artist who sort of fell into administration a bit and an aspiring executive director who successfully made the leap. All of these arts professionals, I have had the pleasure and joy of working with in my up-level coaching program, and they have been so generous to come on here and share their stories with you. They all started from a place of challenges they were facing, which we will learn about and we'll get into. Challenges that I have to say are likely ones you have experienced at one point or another in your own career too, and they were able to break through that and just go on to crush it. So to help me do this, I brought in another alum of the program who is also a member of Team Changing the Narrative, and that is Jeremy Cuevas. Jeremy is an alum, actually not of just the up-level program, but also of my Run It Like a Business Academy. He's also a conductor. He is an arts administrator himself, and he's host of his own podcast, the Podium Time Podcast which all together makes him, in my mind, the perfect person to help tell these stories you're going to hear. And throughout these success series episodes, you'll get to hear some of his story as well, because it's another one that's just so, I was going to say normal, but really the word is relatable. There are some real frustrations uh, that he's experienced that so many of us have, and just this driven approach, trying to achieve some big personal and professional goals. And eventually he was able to do so. I cannot wait to share all of this with you. There's so much coming at you right now. I also have a free resource for you on career building that I will share more about at the end of this episode. But for now, we've got to get going. I'm so excited to bring you this new series. I hope it makes you feel like you are so normal too, to use that word again, and really just so not alone in navigating your career in arts management and that you can see and feel that success in this industry, no matter your role or years of experience or level of seniority, is absolutely possible. I'm Aubrey Bergauer and welcome to my podcast. I'm known in the arts world for being customer centric, data obsessed and for growing revenue. The arts are my vehicle to make the change I want to see in this world, like creating places of belonging, pursuing gender and racial equality, developing high-performing teams and leaders, and leveraging technology to elevate our work. I've been called the Steve Jobs of classical music and the Sheryl Sandberg of the symphony. I've held offstage roles managing millions of dollars in revenue at major institutions, been chief executive of an orchestra where we doubled the size of the audience and nearly quadrupled the donor base, and now I'm here to help you achieve that same kind of success. In this podcast, we are sorting through data and research inside and outside the arts, applying those findings to our work in arts management and bringing in some extra voices along the way, all to build the vibrant future we know is possible for our institutions and for ourselves as offstage administrators and leaders. You're listening to The Offstage Mic. Hi everyone, Aubrey Bergauer here. Before we dive into today's episode, I wanna tell you about Annual Fund Toolkit. 
If you're a nonprofit looking to revolutionize your fundraising strategies, you need to know about Annual Fund Toolkit. They're not just another consulting firm. They're specialists in transforming annual funds through data-driven donor engagement. What sets Annual Fund Toolkit apart is their laser focus on two critical challenges, improving donor retention and growing the major gifts pipeline. You can see why I like them, right? They combine fundraising expertise, data analysis, and strategic planning to help nonprofits like yours reach your goals. I'm particularly excited about their work in the art sector. They have helped organizations like Austin Chamber Music Center and Castle of Our Skins unlock their fundraising potential. And get this, you get one dedicated strategist to help with all aspects of running your fundraising shop, from data to major gift coaching. It's like having an entire fundraising department that intimately understands you and the arts. Annual Fund Toolkit provides a clear roadmap to donor loyalty, automated dashboards to track your progress, and a catalog of proven playbooks. I know their founder, Luis Diaz, personally, and I think he is hands down one of the most brilliant minds in fundraising I've ever met. Whereas many arts groups are stuck with old models that aren't working anymore, the organizations that utilize Lewis's advice and assistance are coming out ahead. If you are ready to take your fundraising to the next level, visit annualfundtoolkit.com. That's www.annualfundtoolkit.com. Trust me, your donors and your mission will thank you. Now, let's dive into today's episode. All right, as we get going here, I want to introduce my new co-host for this series. Hi, Jeremy. Welcome. Hi, Aubrey. I am so excited to be here. This is one of my favorite podcasts. I've been I've literally been listening since day one. I'm so excited. That's amazing. Uh, so this series is highlighting success stories from five really amazing arts administrators, I have to say, but you've been doing the work, you've been talking to these folks. So tell me the high level overview. You spoke with all of them. Yeah, it was it's so much fun to talk to other people in the space, you know, um, anytime we can get together with with people who are doing the same thing. It's just great. So all of these five administrators are at different points in their career. Some are earlier in their careers. Um, one was even a student when they started the up level program. Uh, some ha even have a few years under their belt, more mid-career, and then some are full-on in executive leadership. So we had a big range of people at different points in their careers, all different sizes of organizations too, different types of organizations, and a few different artistic disciplines as well. So no matter where you are or what type or size of organization, uh, you're going to learn a lot in the struggles and obstacles that these people face, because they're all the same that we all face no matter where our job is. I also saw a lot of parallels to my own career, and I'm sure you will as well. Uh, but I think that's the point of having these conversations. Again, all the struggles and obstacles that we face in administration are so similar. And it was just great to see how each of these guests faced their particular struggle and then how it made them stronger on the other side. Yeah, I think that's so real, so relatable. So our first interview is with Allison Lombacher, who is the Associate Director of Digital Engagement with the St. Louis Symphony. One of my favorite orchestras. I probably comes along, <laughs> comes across in the interview. We were just talking about St. Louis Symphony so much. That's awesome. Yeah, I think they are doing, they're just doing so many things right, is how I would put it. But when I first met Allison, though, spoiler, she was not at St. Louis Symphony, and it was not all sunshine and roses. So... What did you and Allison talk about in this interview? Yeah, we got pretty deep. Allison was actually ready to leave the industry. Uh, she shared that she'd pretty much lost faith with orchestras and she was ready to go back into tech, ready to go back into business. But there was one really important moment that we'll talk about in the interview that convinced her to stay. And I don't want to give it all away, but Allison has a really great story to tell. I think that is the perfect setup. Let's hear more from Jeremy and Allison. Hi there, and welcome to the Offstage Mic. My name is Jeremy, and I'm here with Allison Lombacher. Allison, thank you for being here today. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So we are so excited to talk about your journey today. Could you tell us um, a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure, yes. So I am the Associate Director of Digital Engagement with the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra here in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and that includes many things. Um, digital marketing is kind of an easier way of putting it, but lots of social media strategy and website design and email marketing, things like that. So 
Um, many hats like all nonprofits, though. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, we were just talking before the interview. Most people don't know like how excellent the St. Louis Symphony is. I'm from Missouri, and it's just such a good like. If you don't know, go go visit St. Louis and go see the orchestra. They're incredible. Yes, I, I am just blown away all the time by them, and they're the second oldest orchestra in the country, which a lot of people don't know. So it's second to New York and so much history here. Um, we're about to uh, reopen our hall in about a year after a $155 million renovation project. So lots of exciting things coming. And how did you get into arts admin? What was kind of the beginning of that journey to where you are now? I, you know, I have this idyllic story, I feel like, where <laughs> I, I vividly remember the moment I decided to play the flute. So I ended up playing the flute um, throughout high school and it was so fulfilling, but I kind of knew I, I wanted to perform, but it, it just was gonna be a hard road and I was willing to do it. Um, eventually though, I did a mentorship program with the US Air Force Band because I was in um, Washington DC and I ended up shadowing a flutist in the band. And I remember thinking to myself like, wait a minute, I hate rehearsing, like this is kind of boring. And I remember feeling just shattered by that. I was just like, what am I gonna do? Because, you know, creating art is such an intimate thing. Um, and, and deciding like, maybe this isn't for me. I mean, that was really scary because it was like a part of me that felt like it was dying. It was like, who am I? So I remember just bawling to my flute teacher and, and just being like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Like this, it was, it was a very visceral moment. And then I remember in that same mentorship program, I saw someone running around in the back of the office and giving speeches on stage and doing all of this organizational work. And I'm like, wait, there's a job like that? Like, I, I wanna do that. I'm super organized. And this still is like adjacent enough to the art form. Like, how do I, how do I get there? Um, and so that was my first exposure to like realizing, oh wait, there, there are people behind the scenes. So I um, was really excited to then kind of pivot. I ended up getting um, an undergrad in flute performance still, but I also got a business certificate knowing that I eventually wanted to kind of merge those. And then I got an MBA and here I am. Let's go back and, and kind of trace the story of how you got to where you were today. What were some of your, maybe some, some of your early jobs, some of your early positions when you started in arts admin? So when I was in college, I uh, was very closely uh, aligned with the Pittsburgh Symphony in a lot of ways because I went to undergrad in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, so I was an usher there. So I got to see very firsthand. I was, I was paid to just listen to the PSO all the time. It was a dream. Uh, I had an, uh, an internship in the marketing department. Um, I All my teachers were in the PSO. So I was very involved uh, with my local symphony um, early on, which was really helpful to see it from multiple angles. Um, but after uh, I finished with my master's, there were no jobs at the Pittsburgh Symphony and I wanted to stay in the city. So I took a little detour actually in, into the tech industry. So I, um, I was like, who am I? This is, I, I remember thinking like, I'm an artist. Like, what am I doing with robots? Like, this is dumb. Uh, but I am so grateful for that detour because it opened my eyes to just the entirely different end of the spectrum of the world of business because before it was like this very old art form as we know like hundreds of years old and then i was at a startup so i i was able to see you know how how the world currently is functioning in in a really fresh way so i was there for about three and a half years and i knew i wanted to go back into the arts um at some point and i was always kind of on the lookout and the Pittsburgh Symphony had an opening and then I, I took the plunge and I started February of 2020. So it was a great time to start a new job. <laughs> That's become a joke now. February, March of 2020 is the best time to, to do anything. It was the best. I couldn't recommend it more. <laughs> yeah. So from there, I, I started out as the manager of subscription marketing and that basically, um, it, it was challenging, you know, like how do you market a subscription during a pandemic? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it really became a, uh, about retention, which I think was an interesting kind of shift for me rather than like, how do we like 
make money on ticket sales. It's more about how do we keep these people and, and, and make them love us still when we aren't performing for them. So that was a great thought exercise. We got really creative in finding ways um, to just be front of mind. And eventually I kind of worked my way into different marketing roles there. Went down the classical marketing route. So more holistically looking at the patron journey from single ticket buyer to subscriber, et cetera, looking at, you know, specific to classical marketing, which was great having a, a music degree and having a good sense of the rep. Um, I will say I eventually decided to leave. And then I know that you took Aubrey's uh, leadership development course, and that was a pivotal moment for your career. Could you talk about that? Yeah, I am forever indebted to Aubrey. I I, I remember it was December of 2020 when it was just a dire time for everybody. And I, I reached out to her and I was just like, help, like convince me to stay. Literally was like, I'm going to leave and go back to the tech industry because I can't do this anymore. And Aubrey so graciously begged me not to leave. <laughs> and she was just like, the, the arts need people like you, which was just so humbling coming from someone like her. So I really like single-handedly, she was, she was the reason I didn't quit. Eventually that, that developed into a relationship where I just really trusted a lot of what Aubrey was advocating for. And just really, you know, she's, she's saying things that are so important to arts administrators that nobody else is really saying publicly. And, um, it just made me feel really seen, you know, and, and made me feel not alone. And I ended up taking her uh, young professional leadership development course, which was so crucial to, to where I was in my journey at that point. So um, I was hungry to grow, but I was in a place where, again, by the nature of the world at the time, I couldn't really grow because we were feeling stagnant. And so when I took that course, I my eyes were open on just so many things I, I didn't know before. And, and Aubrey communicate, communicated things in such a clear, and linear way that made me feel like, okay, like I, I, I can see ways I can grow tangibly right now. Um, even if I can't move, um, you know, up in the organization, even if I can't leave, I, I felt like there, there are things I could do right now to change, um, the way I, I conduct myself. And it was really, really important to my growth. Yeah. You may have answered it already, but when, when you reached out to her, when you took the course, was there something specific that you were looking for? Yeah. I, I think I just was looking for companionship. Um, I was looking for someone to tell me I wasn't crazy. <laughs> um, I was looking for someone to, to kind of come at nonprofits from a business lens. And I know, you know, Aubrey's book, Run It Like a Business, does a lot of that in, in a great way. But, you know, having an MBA um, and going into the nonprofit world can be challenging because there's a natural scarcity mindset. And I think that makes operating very challenging and it makes efficiency really challenging because it always feels like you're scrambling, especially in a pandemic. Like we all were scrambling and it was really hard. So I was looking for someone to help guide that process of like, okay, what can I do in my position to run it like a business, you know, to make things feel a little bit more stable, at least where I am. Like I can't change everything around me, but what can I do right now to make things feel less chaotic? <laughs> and what did you do to make things feel less chaotic? How did you get out of that? I, I think that I was able to advocate for myself in new ways um, that I couldn't before. I was able to uh, propose new ideas in a way that were more readily received because I knew how to present them. And, and Aubrey gave a lot of great resources for just using data as, as your best friend and, you know, how, how to communicate with busy people. I think that was something I was really taught well on that served me very well. Eventually though, I, I think that my time kind of ran its course there because I, I was just hungry for more growth. And I knew that, there was not much more potential for me in my current position. And so that's when I started using tools that Aubrey also gave around when to quit. So she referenced this, this book by Seth Godin around the, kind of these three stages on when, when to quit. And that was really pivotal for me. I highly recommend looking it up. 
So eventually I knew my growth potential was was nearing its end as it often does in any any job. And eventually I, I started looking and I really, again, had to wrestle. Like I did the Essentials of Orchestra Management program through the League of American Orchestras. So I was fired up on this industry. I mean, I was like, let's shake things up because it's needed or else we're going to die. My momentum was so high that I, I just knew it was my time to kind of start looking at what else is possible in the world. But at the same time, I was still a little burnout on the industry of just kind of like, okay, I know change is possible, but it really doesn't seem like that when you when you really kind of assess the landscape. And so I was at another crossroads where I was like, how much, how committed am I really to the orchestra field? And uh, I ended up trudging forward, very much looking often at open job positions throughout the industry. And I ended up uh, finding the SLSO and taking the plunge. And it was the best decision of my life. I'm so, so grateful that I stuck it through and, and didn't go to another tech industry job. And I've been here about almost a year now. I am very biased, but I think that the SLSO is like the most perfect orchestra in the industry. <laughs> and so like, I'm like, everybody should just work here. <laughs> so part of me, I don't know how to like, for those people who are, who might not end up at the SLSO, like it's not always perfect kind of transitioning to another orchestra. So I don't want to like give this like false sense of security by just saying, get another job, you know? You mentioned that you used your new tools, you advocated, you talked about new initiatives the right way, the way that Aubrey talks about talking about these things. And you did what you could in the place that you were. And it, it wasn't working. I mean, that's the fault of the place that you were. So what are you doing in your current position in St. Louis to just make this the best job, to live your best life as an administrator? It's interesting being in different environments where, um, you know, I, I have the same tools before that I do now. And obviously I have more now, but being able to use them in a context where um, I'm able to truly thrive is life changing. And I feel so supported by my colleagues and, and all of us are really together moving ahead to the same goal. So I'm able to innovate in ways that are um, really exciting. So being in honestly a psychologically safe environment is is so pivotal because I'm able to um, just brainstorm in ways I've never been able to, to do before. So I'm super excited about a lot of the projects we're doing, especially social media strategy is something very dear to me because if we want to reach younger audiences, that's where they are. So I'm really excited about some of the success that we've seen. And honestly, being able to use these tools again, pitching new ideas, uh, we're, we're moving forward with this one really exciting project um, that from the tools that I received from Aubrey's course, I was able to pitch something like a pretty significantly priced project from my level all the way up to the CEO, to the musicians, like everybody was on board. And I couldn't have done that honestly without the tools that Aubrey had taught me. Because I'm in a place where um, everybody is so supportive and innovative and, and ready to go, I feel like I'm able to thrive. So um, really seeing a lot of fun, exciting success stories here. So so follow us along, follow along with us to see how things unravel here. But yeah, I'm, I'm living my best life, as you said. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, you know, St. Louis Symphony is a fantastic orchestra. What made getting this position possible, whether that was people, skills, experience? It was really a lot of experience and passion, I think. Um, this, again, we're at a really interesting time at the SLSO, and um, th there is so much innovation happening here that I think they saw my zeal and uh, we're excited about that. And, and I fit really well into the ethos here. So I felt, you know, from day one, like what I interviewed from honestly, even my screening interview, I, I could tell there's something unique about this orchestra where they care deeply about the people here. Even on their website, they have like the, some of the perks include like fitness reimbursement. I remember that really stuck out to me because I was like, that's something you would see in the tech industry of just like, they care about my well-being. They're a dog-friendly office, like, like things like that kind of like made me think, huh, like this, this feels a little different. 
And so every interview I had with everyone, I just could sense that they just got it. You know, they just really um, cared about um, me, but also cared about the future of this industry and doing well. And I wanted to be a part of it. So it, it was a mixture of me just kind of fitting naturally into the culture, but also at the same time, my experience set me up for success because I speak the language. I know what um, we're doing here and it was a combination of things. Yeah, and I think you found an organization that really fit with your values and what, exactly what you were looking for, um, which is which is rare. It's hard to find and, and you found it. it. It's a miracle, honestly. Like I, I could get emotional thinking about it because I, I was feeling really, I was just like, should I like just throw in the towel? Like there's no way this exists. I, I, and I remember I was in the runnings for a few jobs around the country and thinking like St. Louis, like, I don't know if I can live there. Like, where is St. Louis? I literally couldn't even place it on a map. And so, and that's on me. This is not on the city. <laughs> um, I was an East coast girl. I don't know. And so I, I remember thinking like, does this make sense for my family to uproot everything to this place? And it was just so abundantly clear, like, no, this is, this is the place to be for just so many reasons. And again, like I, it is just a miracle that I landed this job in, in a place that is such a perfect fit for me and for my family. Yeah. Yeah. You said that you were ready to throw in the towel or you felt like that you were. And I don't think that's unique to you at all. I think almost everybody in this industry does. I've had that moment a couple of times, both as an admin and as a conductor. Like it's it's hard to keep going. What advice would you give to somebody who is going through that now or feels that or when somebody does does feel that? This sounds so cliche, but like really don't give up. <laughs> I I was going to and I felt like there was really no hope in this industry. Like we're all going to just keep performing Beethoven's Ninth till the day we die the same way. And <laughs> and it's like, I love Beethoven. Beethoven, I have no beef with Beethoven. However, there is so much more to what we do than just performing, you know? And I very slowly, and I, Aubrey says this all the time, like the narrative is changing. Like it's, it's like before it was just like, we need to change the narrative, but there are tiny little tweaks along the way that are becoming more evident to me. And honestly, the SLSO is a place that um, I see getting it. And we certainly have a long way to go as an industry, um, but we're getting there. And, and I think that more and more people are coming out of the woodwork, recognizing that we need to get there or else we will die. And that is a very scary thought, but if we don't adapt, it could be dire. And so at least from my vantage point, and I, I have connections across the industry, I feel like more people are being, um, are coming together really and creating this band of people who get it and want to see change. And um, we're not alone, you know? And so I would say to someone who is just like, screw this, <laughs> um, that there are people like you out there who will talk shop with you and will innovate with you. Um, you just have to keep trudging along. And if that takes going to another arts organization, then I think it's worth it because I have never been happier in a job in my life. That's so fantastic to hear. Yeah. And I think a lot of those people are listening to this podcast right now. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, how could people get in touch if they want to connect with you? Yeah, I would be happy to connect on LinkedIn. I'm pretty easy to find. There's not many Allison Lawbachers out there at the St. Louis Symphony. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one here. So, <laughs> so yeah, reach out on LinkedIn. I'm happy to talk any, anytime. Awesome. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Hey, offstagers, navigating a career in arts management can be hard sometimes. I know this because I hear it from people I work with all the time. I hear it in the DMs people send me and in my inbox. I hear it when I meet people on the road, speaking at events and conferences. And I know it because I've experienced it myself too over the years. But as you heard today, there are skills you can learn to overcome the obstacles. That's why this fall, I will be leading a free three-part virtual training on how to grow your career in arts management. 
Registration will open soon. So head to aubreybergauer.com slash 33. That's 33 for episode 33. And get on the wait list to be the first to be notified of all the details. That's aubreybergauer.com slash 33. Good marketing talent can be hard to find. That's why I'm so glad I discovered Marketer Hire. As my business has grown this year, I can definitively say a part of that growth was because of the way Marketer Hire helped me not just find good marketing talent I needed, but how fast they did it and how they worked to match me with the perfect people. First, I reached out about an email copywriting project and email platform migration we were going through, and Marketer Hire matched me with Jamie within a week. A few months later, we needed technical support on getting our Google Analytics ready for GA4, and they had us connected to Alec within days. Both Jamie and Alec needed zero training, were incredible to work with and experts in their respective areas, and most important, they completely delivered what I needed on time, on budget, and got the results I needed. What I like about Marketer Hire is that you can engage someone for as long or short as you want. I hired Jamie for a three-month project, for example. On the intake call, they really listened to what I said I needed. I even said on the email copywriting project in particular that I needed someone with an interest in the performing arts. And then when they matched me with Jamie, it turned out she had a theater background and is still a member of her local thespian troupe to this day. Both Jamie and Alec were matched with my business so quickly and were able to move my projects forward so much quicker than if I had led a traditional hiring process or search. The whole process was really easy from start to finish, and they never made me feel obligated to proceed if I didn't want to. Marketer Hire was even able to work with my small business budget. Arts organizations, imagine working with Fortune 500 level talent who ramps up to understand your organization fast and then delivers great work. Get a $1,500 credit toward your first hire when you go to try.marketerhire.com slash offstagemike. Whether your arts organization needs email copywriting or Google Analytics set up like I did, or if you need paid ads, paid search, or even a fractional CMO, Marketer Hire will get you set up with top talent fast. One more time, that's try.marketerhire.com slash offstagemike to get started and get your $1,500 credit. That's all for today, folks. Thanks so much for listening. If you like what you heard here, hit that button to follow and subscribe to this podcast. And if you've learned something or gotten value from this, please take two seconds to leave a quick one tap rating or review in return. To all of you one more time, thanks again. See you next time on the Offstage Mic. The Offstage Mic is produced by me, Aubrey Bergauer, and Aaron Allen. The show is edited by Novo Music, an audio production company of all women audio engineers and musicians. Our theme music is by Alex Broll. Additional podcast support this season comes from Jeremy Cuevas, Kelly Stedman, other members of the Changing the Narrative team, and social media brand management by Classical Content. This is a production of Changing the Narrative. And we're back. Today on Top Tunes, the music production... Is it just me, or does this sound terrible? Wait, I think I heard of someone who might be able to help us. There's this company called Novo Music... They provide across-the-board audio solutions from recording repair to audio editing to original music and sound design and beyond. Well, what are we waiting for? Today on Top Tunes, the Now music- that's better. Novo Music. Conducting your creative vision. Find out more at novomusic.co.